All right, so we're going to be looking at uh, our AP statistics. Moving on to Unit 3, uh, we're going to be looking at sampling in this uh, whole unit and different ways of doing different samples. Uh, we're going to start off by looking at uh, uh, setting up and planning out a study and looking at different ways that you can collect this data. So uh, the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to be talking about basically collecting your data. So the number one thing that you want to do is identify what is the population or what group you want to be um, gathering data from and what you want to, uh, what you want to um, basically conclude from that. What's that population group? Um, do you want to look at a certain class? Do you want to look at a whole school? Do you want to look at a whole state? Depending on what you're trying to do, it's going to change that sample that you're going to take or that subset of the population that you're going to take. If you're just looking at a school, if you're just looking at, let's say, your high school that you're in, then you just have to take students from that high school. But if you want to take it from a larger and you want to talk about all the high schoolers at uh, in your city, you'd have to take samples from multiple different high schools. Um, and if you want to expand that out to the state or the country, you have to expand it out even larger. So it just depends on how large you want to make it that you're going to have to uh, figure that out. So let's talk quickly about the difference between a population and a sample. So in a population, what you're looking at is you're looking at an entire group um, for whatever that uh, set that you want. So uh, if I'm looking at high schoolers, a population would be every single high school in a class, in a school, in the state, all the males, all the females, every single person that fits in that category. That is the population. Um, so jumping down to our third bullet point here, if you're talking about the census, so every 10 years the U.S. does a census, the idea of it is you're collecting data from every single person in the population. So every single uh, person that lives in the United States uh, is supposed to basically complete a document that has that fills out some basic data for them so that the government can have that data and they count how many people are here. And that deals with stuff on the government side that we're not going to talk about. But that's what a census would be. Because that's so time consuming and it's so expensive to do and it's almost impossible to get it perfect, that's why we do what are known as samples, which are basically just subsets of a population that we use to predict the overall. So let's say you're looking at an election anytime you see polls from an election those are taken from a sample and those samples are taken from subsets of populations they have x number of people that are here x number here z number here y number here depending on what they are trying to gather and um, move on from there so a sample is basically just a smaller one that we have um, there's two major ways that we look at collecting our data the first one is known as an observational study. The second one is an experimental. Um, so an observational study is uh, really uh, what we're going to be looking at first here. Um, and uh, we'll talk about experimental later on in this unit. But observational studies are, are essentially you're looking at individuals and you're gather, gathering data um, or taking measurements of them, but you don't try to influence their responses. So um, so this could be something as easy as just taking people's weights or take, taking people's heights. What was your GPA? How much money do you make? What's your favorite color, etc.? That type of stuff is just observational. An experimental one is one in which you uh, purposely do some sort of treatment on individuals to see what the response is and measure that response or see how much that changes. That's experimental. And observational is just, hey, give me some information. Boom, I got it. We're moving on to our next thing. So that's the difference. So let's talk a little bit more about observational, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, experimental later on. So observational study is completely, it's supposed to be hands off. So you're not trying to change people's um, influence on anything. So you don't want to do things that would make somebody go, this is what I want. Oh, no, I'm going to change my answer. You don't want that to happen in an observational study. Okay, so there's two different way, two different types within observational that you have. One is retrospective. Retrospective means that you're looking at things that basically can't be changed because they happened in the past. So if I'm looking at, let's say, I want to find the 
uh, is, um, you know, is the MVP for Major League Baseball, do they usually hit a certain number of home runs? I can go back into the data of MLB history, and I can look at this is who the MVP was, this is how many home runs they had. And then I can uh, draw a conclusion based off of that. Okay, uh, That's retrospective. Prospective is basically you collect data from individuals into the future. So we could be collecting data now going, okay, how are students doing in high school? And then in five years, we can go, how did you do in college? And we can compare those. Oh, students that had a 3.5 or better in high school graduated uh, college at a 75% rate. That's a perspective, okay? You're looking at here and then into the future what's happening. Those are cost more, those cost more, they take more time because of what they are, okay? Uh, sample surveys, uh, basically you're trying to learn from an individual population, okay? Uh, within a, uh, from the whole, so you're not taking the whole thing. <clears throat> so making generalizations here, um, a sample is only, uh, you can only make that generalization based off of the sample that you've taken. So if, the example here, if you pull seniors and ask them what their favorite soda is, and let's say they say our favorite soda is Dr. Pepper, then you can only say that seniors at that specific high school, their favorite, high, their favorite soda is Dr. Pepper. You can't say all the students at that high school because you didn't ask a sample from all the students. You only asked seniors. So you can't apply that to other population groups, freshmen, sophomore, juniors. You can't even take it from your high school and go to the public high school, uh, the next public high school down the road and ask them and assume that they have the same one because it's a different population group, okay? So when you make a generalization from a sample, it needs to be from that sample that you took, okay? Um, you can't make casual relationships between the variables based off of an observational study because you can't say that this causes that. That's the main thing with observational studies. Observational studies are, this is what we see, but you don't say this is what caused that, okay? So again, this correlation causation thing, we're not trying to say this is causing that. We're saying, yes, there's a correlation here, but we're not saying it's the cause of it. Just because senior's favorite drink is Dr. Pepper doesn't mean that if you're a senior, it's because you're a senior that your favorite drink is Dr. Pepper. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about a couple different types of samplings going forward. We're gonna talk about brief description of it, uh, advantage, a disadvantage, and then a quick example of what it is. That's what's gonna pop up on the screen in those orders. So the first one we have here is a convenient sampling. Convenient sampling is basically taking a sample or gathering data from a subgroup that is very easy for you to do, okay? Um, it's basically readily available. This could be gather, gathering the information from the internet, um, uh, or this could be as simple as the example down at the bottom where a principal stands outside the gym and just asks students that walk past. It could be you just outside of the grocery store asking the people that are walking by. They're coming to you, you're not really going out and trying to find them. And that's part of the reason why it's kind of like a convenient sampling. It's easy and it's fairly cheap because you're just paying the person that's standing there. You're not paying anybody else really to do stuff. Uh, the disadvantage of this is that it might not be a great representation of the population. Uh, the reason for this could be something as, let's say, the principal example. With this principal standing outside the gym asking students, who are the students that he or she is most likely to run into? They're going to be students that are probably athletes that might be going to the gym or from the gym or ones that have a PE class. Not every student goes through the gym or goes by the gym, okay? Um, if you're at a grocery store, let's say you're over at, um, let's say you're over at a, the uh, a Ralph's or a Vons and you're staying out there. Well, not everybody goes to those. They go to other grocery stores. They might go to like a Sprouts or a Fraser Farms or, um, you know, uh, a, a different type of grocery store. So you're not going to get all the population groups just by standing in one location. Okay. You're just kind of hopefully getting things, uh, hopefully getting the samples that come to you that gets all of them. Um, 
The next one is the voluntary response sample or a self-selected. Uh, basically what this is is that uh, you send the information out and you just go, if you want to respond, respond. I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to ask you anything like that. Um, anytime that you guys have gone to gross or gone uh, to fast food restaurants or even other stores and they go, oh, if you do this at the bottom, fill out this survey, you'll get, you know, you'll get a free jumbo jack or whatever it is that you want. Uh, those are volunteer response samples. Okay. They're self-selected. Okay. Advantage to those easy to collect, very, very cheap because you don't even have, all you do is you just get the data out. People come, basically come to you, you go, hey, if you want to fill this out, fill this out, awesome. The disadvantage to that is that you only get the response of people that might have uh, overrepresented their opinions, okay? Um, uh, another example of this is if you look at, let's say, the reviews on locations or reviews on like Amazon. Usually for reviews on Amazon, you might see five stars or one star. And it's either this is the greatest product I've ever had, or it worked perfectly, or the one star is it was garbage. It was complete crap. I hate this thing. Isn't what I wanted. You have that very much drastic, this was great, this is terrible, and there's no in between, okay? Um, and that's the one issue with this self-selecting is that if you're in the if you're in the middle if you're on the fence you're like eh, I'm not gonna voice my opinion on this that's not worth my time you know oh, I don't need this you know free food from Taco Bell because nah it's not worth my you know five minutes of time to do it you lose that middle group of people which is probably the largest group that you would have. Uh, next up is the uh, SRS, which is the most common one that you're going to see and you'll probably use, which is known as the simple random sample, uh, SRS. Um, uh, the reason why this is the one that's most commonly used is because of the disadvantage. There's not really any. Um, and the only thing that you could have is that cost and time might be an issue, but that just depends on how large of a sample you use. Um, another disadvantage that could happen is just by random chance, it might be a bad sample. Very rare, but it still happens. Because you have that randomness in it, it's not precise, so it's not perfect. Um, basically what it is is you take the entire population, whatever it is that you have, and you go, okay, here's my entire population. I'm going to mix them all up, give them all a number, mix them all up, and I'm going to randomly select a certain number out of there. And those are the ones I'm doing it. Um, uh, because it's so easy to do and easily to randomize, that's a major advantage for it. It also is very effective. And usually it gets you a nice, uh, a nice sample that covers a lot of different groups that you'd want to cover. Um, so like an example is like, let's say you live in a place with an HOA and you want to do a survey of the people that live at the HOA. There's 156 houses in the HOA. You randomly select numbers between one and 56 and you know, you can pull them out of a hat. You can use a number generator, use a computer, whatever you pick 20. And those are the ones you check doesn't matter what the what the 20 are hopefully it's random enough and you get a nice wide range okay um, same thing with high schoolers I can give every student at a high school a random number and those are the ones I'm going to ask my questions to um, and no other okay so here would be kind of an image of what it would look like if you were doing a random sample you see you have all these dots just kind of everywhere and the red ones that are um, that are shown with the extra circle around them those are the ones that were selected but it is completely random there's not a really a pattern there um, they're just randomly selected from there okay all right next up is our stratified random sampling and in a stratified ram random sampling is you create what are known as strata okay um, and basically what strata are, are groups within the population and when you create these groups then what you do is you randomly select people from each of those groups based off of a certain um, percentage, okay? Um, just thinking of, let's say, elections. Uh, so when this was recorded, we just had election a couple, um, a little while ago, but all the polling and everything that they do, basically what it is is they go, okay, 
here's my sample I want to do for asking who I think either candidate A or candidate B who's going to win or who they're selecting. Okay, I'm going to take, uh, I need to take 35% of, you know, uh, Democrats, I need 35% Republicans, and then I need the rest to be independents. I need 52% uh, women, I need 48% men, and you can make these subgroups and then randomly sample from those. So you can make different groups and then select from there randomly so that you get, you basically forcing, okay, I'm going to try to make this as much like the population as possible, but then randomly select in there, okay? Um, so an advantage of that is that you can get, um, you avoid that chance in a random sample where you don't get, um, a nice random sample that, that slim chance that a random sample comes up very skewed in one way, the stratified sampling, you go, okay, I've put them in the groups and then I've selected them from there. So now I don't have the, you know, oh, if I randomly select going back to the the election one. If I randomly select 100 people, oh, 60 of them were, were uh, Democrats and only 20 were Republicans and the rest were independents. All that doesn't balance out with what the data shows what it should be. Using stratified, you can go, okay, I'm taking this many of this group, this many of this group, this many for this group, and hopefully that evens it out. A disadvantage for that is that sometimes you just can't make a strata or a group. Um, um, with whatever the population that you're dealing with. So if you can't make a group with it, then this doesn't really work. Go back to the SRS and you should be fine. Okay. So uh, the example below is talking about an idea about with uh, athletes at homecoming. And so the director basically divides up them by teams and then randomly selects players from each team to get their opinion on it. Okay. So this is what the image would look like. So each of these stratum stratum which is the single for strata um, just like the single or the yeah uh, data or data is plural for datum uh, so your stratums one two three four five and six and then you've randomly selected three from each one so you get an even number from each group okay so that's your um, that's your strata Next up is your cluster. So your cluster sampling um, is very similar to uh, strata. Uh, the only difference though is instead of um, dividing them up by a group, by a specific criteria, you're basically just going, ah, these are close together, one cluster. These are close together, one cluster, and um, doing it that way. So um, like example of this one could be, um, looking at zip codes. So, oh, anybody that lives in the zip code of, you know, three, four, three, four, five, six, seven, um, that's one group. Anybody that lives in three, seven, two, four, five, that's a different group. Okay. So you break them up based off of a zip code or, um, some other group grouping, uh, think of it in high school class, you know, whoever's in, uh, room 200, whoever's in room 201, 202, 205, 208, okay, those are your groups. Um, uh, uh, advantage of this, you don't need uh, to look at the entire population because you're just looking at a small group here. So instead of having to um, list out the entire population and give everybody a number, you're just going, Hey, everybody in this room, you're what my sample is going to be. Hopefully it's going to be uh, good. Issue for that is that the variability between the samples could depend on which clusters you choose. Because let's say you pick, let's say you're doing the class ones and your question is something about uh, what students want to do in college and you pick a math room and, um, and a science room at random most of those students might be saying, well, we want to go into the engineering, we want to go into nursing, you know, they want to go into certain majors, and you're going to miss out more on those liberal arts majors, because you're not having the English side, or you're not having, you know, the foreign language side of it, or a history. Um, that's an issue that can happen, is that when you pick those clusters, they get 
sucked into one. So the example down below is a college divides up the students by schools, nursing, engineering, teaching, etc. cetera, um, divides them up by majors, and then they select certain colleges to ask for those surveys. So this is what it would look like, is that you um, are basically taking clusters here, and then you take an entire cluster. So it's not, it's different from the stratified. Stratified is you make those groups, and then you randomly select some from every group. The cluster ones is that you just select a whole cluster. So you select a whole group. So if you think of these as eight or nine different classrooms, they took classroom three, four, and eight. Whatever students were in there, those were the ones that they picked. Okay. It might have been that, you know, classroom three was all seniors, classroom four was all juniors, and eight was a mix of juniors and seniors. Then you've got no underclassmen in your sample. Because all the underclassmen were in, you know, five, six, seven, and nine at that time. So that's the major issue with um, your cluster sampling is that you don't get the, um, uh, it's not as, it's not as good as a stratified, uh, but it is, it can make it simpler because you're just going group, group, group. Um, uh, systemic random sampling, basically you randomly select based off a random starting point and then you have a system or um, a systematic way of picking them. So, hey, I'm going to pick this person and then every fifth one after that I'm going to ask. Um, advantage to this, everybody's got an equal chance of being selected. You don't have one, you know, one type of population is less likely to get picked than population than population B. Everybody's got the same amount. So that's the positive with uh, this one, is that everybody has the same chance of um, being selected because it's always the fifth person or it's always the eighth person, whatever it is. Um, um, the disadvantage of this is that not every sample of size N has an equal chance of being selected. Um, yeah, so it, again, it just depends on the groups that you're looking at and the subgroups. But it is basically the chance of everybody being selected is the same, but it's not for sure going to um, have that amount. And that's the issue. Okay, um, so example, HP computers um, selects the 200th computer on assembly line, and that's the one they inspect right there um, for quality. Systematic, a lot of uh, companies, businesses, that's what they'll do. They'll just go oh, every, every 100th or 2,000th that comes off the line. That's the one we check. Oh, it works. Quality control is good. Oh, it's within range. We're good. Oh, this needs to be fixed. Let's go back and recalibrate it, make sure everything's fine. Um, I mean, it works, it, this works better in that type of business setting with um, this type of business setting where it's, you know, it's like a machine running through everything. So here's just the example. If you can see, you can see a pattern. You see these diagonal lines. I want to say after, if you're going across the top, I think it's every seven, something like that. So after the fourth one, then it's every seven gets picked. So one, two, three, four, first dot, then there's seven, next dot, or six, and then the seventh one, and then another six, seven, six, seven, six, seven, so on and so forth. Um, and that's all the way through. But it's boom, 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 it's like a machine, okay? All right, so the last thing we have here is replacement, which um, with replacement, without replacement, what this is mostly talking about is when you take a sample and you uh, ask them about uh, what they think, um, if you are replacing them, that means once they've been selected, you can put them back into the pool and they can be selected again. Yes, it doesn't make sense, but sometimes you can't avoid it. Uh, think of like if you do convenience sampling where you're standing outside of a grocery store and you're filling out stuff and you're asking people questions and then two days later, um, the next person's working and that same person comes through and answers the questions again. That's without, that's with replacement. That person has just voiced their opinion twice. Uh, without replacement means once they've been selected, they can't be selected again. So they're, they're picked, they're done, they're out. Okay. Um, we'll use this more and we'll talk about this more when we talk about probability. When we talk about probability and talking about with replacement, without replacement, it changes the odds of people being selected. 
um, and things happening. So that's more in our next unit that we talk about this a little bit more, but just think about it. Usually you're going to say without replacement. Um, anytime that you're building these samples, you just say, oh, you know, we're doing a simple random sample without replacement. Um, and that's kind of the standard because you don't want to repeat any of it. Okay. All right. So that's the end of this unit or this section for this unit. Um, yep. And then we'll continue on to our second unit, our second section, section two, which is dealing with uh, some problems with your uh, sampling and talking about biases and different things like that. All right.